Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, everyone. It's literally Christmas Day and my family is sleeping downstairs. And I get to talk about how we go from genes or genetics, the recipe, to proteins. Pretty amped up about it. Merry Christmas and Happy Christmas to me. So, things we're going to talk about in this lecture is how do we go from DNA to protein? What are some of the experiments that led to um, the discovery of how we did this process? How do we modify and control the process? What are the enzymes involved? Okay, and also some of the differences between the way prokaryotes and eukaryotes do this process. So the overall process of, of going from DNA to protein is called the central dogma of molecular biology. Um, and a gene is essentially a sequence of DNA that codes for an individual protein. It's the recipe, one recipe, for making a protein. They are expressed or turned on, and they make polypeptides, which are long sequences of proteins, which are made of amino acids, right? And it's those proteins that determine the behavior and physical characteristics of an organism. Um, what we were talking about last time, right before we left for break, was DNA replication, the process of going from DNA and making copies of DNA. The only time you're going to want to do that is when you want to replicate a cell. Okay, so that, ne that next cell has a full copy of all of the, the blueprints for making every single protein. So that process that we talked about with the replication fork, the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, right? DNA polymerase, ligase, helicase, all of those different enzymes, they're all important for DNA replication or making a copy of the DNA for when we want to do mitosis or binary fission for replicating a cell. Now we're going to talk about really the purpose of having that recipe book, which is to make all of these different proteins. So in the early 1950s, we still didn't know about the relationship between different nucleic acids. Right at this point, right in the early 50s, they figured out the structure of DNA. Watson Crick, with the help of Franklin and Wilkins, figured out that structure. But they still didn't know, like, what was RNA? What's the whole point of that? How do we go from DNA, and how is it the genetic material that leads to the characteristics that um, we, we were seeing that were inherited? So the first really important enzyme, or really important um, study that was done was to figure out that one gene coded for one enzyme, or inevitably one gene codes for one protein, was um, a an experiment by Beetle and Tatum. So this is this one gene one enzyme idea is not actually perfectly correct. Okay, it's not perfect because actually one gene can code for um, several different polypeptides through gene, DNA splicing, which we'll talk about. But also, um, sometimes multiple genes actually come together to form one giant protein. For you Paul McCartney fans out there. So Beetle and Tatum, George Beetle and Edward Tatum, came up with the one gene, one protein hypothesis. And they were trying to figure out a way to figure out, like kind of uh, determine how can we mess with DNA and ineffably figure out that it's a gene that codes for specific proteins. So what they did was they used a, um, uh, a fungus called Neurospora. It's basically a mold. And they bombarded it with x-rays. And those x-rays caused mutations. So they, what they, they basically did was they grew it on these different types of me media. Uh, media meaning um, essentially nutrients. Okay, And in minimal media, that means nothing extra was added. Okay. Now, their goal was to figure out the production of the amino acid called arginine. And in the production of arginine, there's actually multiple different intermediate steps. So you have a precursor, then enzyme 1 turns the precursor into ornithine. Enzyme B, excuse me, enzyme A turns precursor into ornithine. Enzyme B turns it into citrulline. And enzyme C turns citrulline into arginine. So they created these different classes of mutants that would grow in these different um, media, these different intermediates. And they essentially showed, like, for example, class A mut mutants. And they didn't know exactly. They figured this all out. But they had a mutation in gene A. So gene A or e ends up not coding for a proper enzyme A. And if you don't have enzyme A, you can't turn the precursor into ornithine unless you can't turn ornithine to citrulline and citrulline into arginine. And in that situation, we knew that there, or they knew that there was a mutation in A in the first enzyme because it wouldn't grow on A because arginine is an essential amino acid. It would die if it didn't have it. But it did grow on um, 
the minimal media and ornithine because they didn't need to turn the precursor into ornithine. They already had it. So the mutation was in the enzyme that makes ornithine from the precursor. So anytime you had anything after that within the sequence, you would code for arginine and you would be able to survive or the neural spore would be able to survive. Class two mutants had a mutation in gene B. In that case, yeah, the precursor could be turned into ornithine, but ornithine could never be turned into citrulline. So whether you had minimal media or ornithine, you could not convert that into arginine, therefore it would die. But if you did have citrulline or arginine, it would survive. In class three mutants, that was an enzyme C, so you had to have arginine in order to survive because all of the other, any other step, the precursor to ornithine or the, or the ornithine is citrulline, they would never be able to turn that into arginine and therefore the organism would die. So after coming up with this experiment, they determined that it was one gene that coded for each of these individual enzymes and they created these different mutants through bombarding with x-rays to determine that. Okay, so this is kind of a, just a quick verbal description of what we just talked about. Um, so at this point, right, we knew DNA is the heritable material. We found that out from Griffith and Avery McLeod and McCarty and Hershey and Chase, right? And we talked about the structure of DNA, Watson, Franklin, and Crick. Um, and then each gene codes for one protein, and that was determined by Beetle and Tatum. But how do we actually do that? How, the, how do we make proteins from, from a gene? How do our cells read the gene? How do we regulate the amount of the gene being read? How do we make the exact amount of protein that we actually need or want? Okay, so now we're going to talk about the actual process. Uh, there's actually an intermediate step that turns DNA into RNA, and that process is called transcription or rewriting. When you transcribe something, that's the process of taking so something in, in certain words, right, and then rewriting it again, as opposed to a different process called translation, where you actually translate it and change the language, and that's going to be a, an important distinction, uh, distinction uh, coming up. So RNA is basically a disposable copy of, a DNA, of DNA. Think of DNA as being a recipe book, right? What RNA is, it's basically a, um, if you were to take a copy of the recipe, and it, let's say your friend wanted a recipe uh, from your grandmother's famous recipe book. You're not going to give your friend the copy of the recipe book. That's your original copy. So you're going to make a copy of it, right? To give to them that's disposable. If they lose it, who cares? You still have the original. RNA is kind of like that disposable copy where DNA is like your original that you don't want to get rid of. So RNA differs from DNA in three different ways. So RNA is single-stranded. It's not double-stranded like DNA. It's not a double helix, but it can fold back on itself to form kind of a secondary structure. We're going to talk about um, tRNA, for example. You can definitely see that in, in, in transfer RNA. Um, the, the sugar in RNA is ribose as opposed to deoxyribose, hence the R in RNA as opposed to the D. And in RNA, the fourth base, there's no thiamine. Instead, they have uracil, which um, is designated by U. So A will pair with U in RNA, or RNA will match up with A with U and um, in G and C. So here's showing you those differences. The only difference in the sugar, look, is this OH group right here in deoxyribose versus ribose, slightly different. Um, there's the difference between uracil and thiamine. It's very tiny. It's just having a methyl group attached right here as opposed to just the hydrogen in uracil. So thiamine has that methyl group. And here's showing you how it's single-stranded, how sometimes it can fold back on itself, but it is single-stranded. And notice the U's that are in there too. So that's one of the ways you can always tell RNA is if it has U's in it. So now we must turn RNA into protein. How do we do that? Uh, the RNA is called which we'll call in this case mRNA, there's other types as well, is going to be copied from the DNA and sent out of the nucleus to a ribosome. The ribosome is then going to read it. It acts like a little chef. The ribosome will read the mRNA, the message, and create the, and assemble the protein. That process is called translation. Now you're actually changing the message into from a nucleic acid into a protein. You are changing the language. So that's how you can remember translation. You change the language. When you're going from DNA to mRNA, you're going from nucleic acid to nucleic acid. You're just rewriting it. So you're not, you're transcribing it. When you go from R, uh, nucleic acid to a protein, you're actually translating it because you change the language. So this is the process going from DNA, making a copy of that sequence of DNA or copy of a gene. Right? Remember, a gene is just like one of those recipes that codes for a protein. We copy it into mRNA form, and then it goes to a ribosome where it is read, and the protein is then assembled.
So DNA goes to mRNA goes to protein. This was all a review of things you probably learned, except for Beetle and Tatum, um, freshman year. Okay, so that's your living environment refresher, or now it's called just biology, right? Now we'll go through the AP biology, biology version. We'll start all the way back from the beginning of the process.